What's up my sad stars, Michael Princhuk here, ready to talk to you about the top five things that you need to know when it comes to constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion. Now before we dive into those top five things, let's make sure you understand what the heck a confidence interval for a population proportion even is. Well, the idea is very simple. When populations are really big, knowing a population proportion from that population is, well, pretty difficult. For example, what proportion of all high school students are lactose intolerant? I have no idea. The only way I could figure that out is if I survey every single high school student in the world and that's, well, pretty impossible. But what I can do is I can get a sample and from that sample, I can get a sample proportion of teenagers that are lactose intolerant and we call that sample proportion P hat. That sample proportion is what we call a point estimate. It's an estimate of the population proportion I'm trying to find, in this particular case, teenagers that are lactose intolerant, and I hope that that point estimate points me in the right direction in terms of what that population proportion could possibly be. Now we know the one thing samples do very, very well is that they vary. So just because our sample showed us one particular proportion doesn't mean that's what's gonna be true for the entire population. So what we do is we construct a confidence interval. And that confidence interval gives us a pretty good idea where the true population proportion could be. So now that you understand the basics of it all, let's dive into the top five things that you need to know when it comes to constructing one of these confidence intervals. The first thing you have to know is how to actually construct one of these. On the AP exam, you're probably gonna have a question, hey, construct a confidence interval for this population proportion, whether it be an FRQ or a multiple choice. Now, I like to look at the entire process, beginning to end, as a four-step process. Some other teachers might show two or three steps, but I like to look at it as four steps. Step one is simply naming what it is you're trying to find and identifying the proper procedure that you're going to use. Now that proper procedure is what we call a one sample Z interval for a population proportion. And then after that's gonna be the context. For example, I'm gonna find a one sample Z interval for the proportion of all teenagers in the United States that are lactose intolerant. Something along those lines where you're identifying the procedure, one sample Z interval for a population proportion, and then giving the context for exactly what that population parameter is that you're trying to estimate. Step two is checking the conditions. Now the conditions surround the idea that we need to examine or at least theorize a sampling distribution for sample proportions. So the three conditions that have to be true for that sampling distribution to be usable is first, the sample must be selected randomly to avoid bias. Second, the size of the sample must be less than 10% of the population for what it was taken from. And third, the sample needs to be big enough. Now, how do we know we're big enough when we're working with proportions? We need to make sure that we have 10 or more successes in our sample and 10 or more failures in our sample. Now, success just means what we're looking for and failure just means not what we're looking for. So we just gotta make sure we have 10 or more yeses and 10 or more noes in our sample. That way we're big enough. Now the third step is actually the most fun because it's the math part where we actually build the conference interval with this simple formula. We're gonna start with our sample proportion p hat. We're gonna go up and we're gonna go down by adding and subtracting what we call the margin of error. The margin of error is the, I, the, the part that we add and subtract. It is a combination of two things. In fact, it's the product of two things. Our critical z star and the standard error. Now the critical Z star can be found using a Z table or you could also use invert norm on your TI-84 calculator. That Z star is completely based on how confident you wanna be. For example, if we wanna be 90% confident, that means we're talking about 90% of samples in the middle. That means 10% are left out, five at the bottom and five at the top. So if you do an invert norm for the bottom or to the left 0.05, you'll get the proper Z star. Or for 95% confident, that means we're talking about the 95% of samples in the middle, that means 5% are left out, two and a half at the bottom, two and a half at the top. So we're gonna do an invert norm of 0.025 and that'll give us our Z star. So it's that exact process depending on your level of confidence. Then we need the standard error. The standard error is the square root of P hat times one minus P hat all divided by the sample size N. Now, this is the exact same formula for the standard deviation of a sampling distribution for sample proportions, but since we do not know the true P, we're using our P hat instead. That's why it gets called standard error. No big deal. Building this interval is quite easy. All you gotta do is plug in the right numbers in the right spots. Now, the fourth step of constructing a confidence interval is actually interpreting what that interval tells you. 
We have to start off with our level of confidence. So we'll say something along the lines of, I'm 95% confident that the true population proportion of teenagers that are lactose intolerant is between X and Y, which is the bottom and the top of your interval. So making sure you follow those four steps to give a perfect idea of exactly how it is, or exactly what is needed to construct that confidence interval. Now that we understand the process, let's take a look at a quick example. Marine biologists have been noticing that more and more aquatic sea fans are becoming infected with a fungus that is causing them to die off in extreme numbers. To estimate the proportion of infected sea fan, researchers select a random sample of 55 sea fans throughout the Atlantic Ocean, and of those 55, 12 were infected. Let's use this data to create a 95% confidence interval to estimate the population proportion of infected sea fans. So step one is simply identifying the process and putting it in context. So I'm going to find a one sample Z interval for the population proportion of infected sea fans in the Atlantic Ocean that have this fungal disease. Step two is checking those conditions. The sample must be random to avoid bias. The sample size of 55 sea fans is assumed to be less than 10% of all of them, so that we have independence, or we could assume independence. And the sampling distribution is big enough because we have 12 successes, infected sea fans, and that leaves us with 43 failures or non-infected sea fans. Both of those numbers are larger than 10, so our sampling distribution will be normal. Next up, we're going to actually build the confidence interval. Now, on the AP exam, they like when you start off with the formula. So identifying that I'm going to use the formula P hat plus or minus my critical value Z star times the standard error formula. Now, all I got to do is substitute everything in. Now, keep in mind the 12 infected C fans was how many were infected. We need the proportions. So we're going to take 12, divide it by our sample size of 55 to get 0.2182 as the actual proportion of infected C fans. Now, from that value, we're going to add or subtract our margin of error. The Z star for 95% confident is 1.96. Once again, I use the invert norm to find that. 95% of samples in the middle, 5% left out, 2.5 at the bottom, 2.5 at the top. So if we do an invert norm of the bottom or to the left, 0.025, I get that 1.96. And then the standard error form is a giant square root. We're going to take our P hat, 0.2182, the opposite of our P hat, or 1 minus it, we get 0.7818, divided by the sample size of 55. And that gives us a margin of error of 0.1092, or about 11%. Now we're just going to take our p hat and add and subtract that margin of error to get the bottom of our interval to be 0.0109, excuse me, and 0.3274. And now finally for our interpretation, I'm 95% confident the true proportion of infected sea fans in the Atlantic Ocean is somewhere between 10.9% and 32.74%. And that's it. That's how simple the four steps are to construct a confidence interval. The second thing you need to be able to do when it comes to constructing confidence intervals is use them to make justifications about claims. So let's go back to our CFAN example for a second. Let's just say that somebody claimed that more than 40% of CFANs are infected. Does our interval support that claim? Does our evidence give evidence that that claim is true? Well, the answer would be no. Our entire interval was below 40%. Our interval went from 10.9% to 32.74%. So we're pretty confident, 95% confident, that under 40% of C fans are infected. Therefore, our sample does not give evidence that it's more than 40%. But another question could say, you know, hey, we think that 30% of C fans are infected. Does our interval provide evidence that it could be 30%? And in that case, the answer would be yes. 30% falls in our interval, so it could certainly be true. Any number in our interval is a possibility for the true population proportion. It's not more likely to be at the bottom or the top or in the middle. It's just, well, anywhere in that interval. So since 30% falls in our interval, there is evidence that 30% could in fact be the true value. Or at least we don't, you know, maybe a better way of saying it would be, we can't say 30% is wrong. We don't know that it's for certain the true proportion of all C fans that are infected, but our interval says that it might be. We just can't officially say that it's incorrect. So make sure you understand that we can use confidence intervals to make some justifications or to justify, excuse me, some claims about the population proportion.
The third thing that you have to be able to do is explain what your level of confidence means. This has nothing to do with a particular problem. All we're saying is, hey, when you claim that you're 95% confident, what does that even mean? Well, it's not a probability. Some kids will say, well, there's a 95% chance. There's a 95% probability that the truth is in your interval. Absolutely not. Or some kids will say, well, 95% of the time it's in the interval. No, it's nothing new with time. It's all about samples. Think of it like this. If we were to look at many, 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 many samples, every sample would have its own sample proportion. And every one of those sample proportions could be used to construct a confidence interval. So at the end of the day, many, many, many samples would produce many, many, many sample proportions and they would produce many, many, many confidence intervals. 95% of all those possible confidence intervals constructed from the same sample size taken from the same population would contain the true population proportion. We're just 95% confident that ours is one of them. If 95% of all possible intervals contain the truth, well, we would be 95% confident ours is one of them. Yes, there is a 5% chance that our sample doesn't contain the truth. Now, let's just think about that for a second. If our sample or if our interval does not contain the truth, what that would mean is that the sample we got was a really, really, really unlikely one. We must have gotten one of those bottom 2.5% or top 2.5% of samples that are so far from the true population proportion in the middle of the sampling distribution that once we built our interval, we somehow didn't capture the truth in it. But remember what we've been trying to teach you. Samples like those are very unlikely. Those types of samples should not happen. What type of sample should happen? <laughs> One right smack dab in the middle. And that's why when we build an interval around it, we'll contain the true population proportion somewhere in our interval. So that's why we're 95% confident. So when you're asked that question, keep in mind it's all about samples. 95% of samples create sample proportions that create intervals and 95% of all of those intervals will will contain the true population proportion. The fourth thing you need to be able to do when it comes to confidence intervals for population proportions is know how to solve for a particular sample size that will produce a given margin of error. Now, if you think about it, this actually makes a lot of sense. Researchers typically go into a problem before they've looked at any samples or collected any data and they say, hey, I kind of want to be pretty accurate, so I want a really low margin of error, maybe one, two, five percent. Again, a margin of error that's pretty small because that's going to give you a more accurate interval that people could trust. And then they say, well, okay, to produce that small of a margin of error, what type of sample size do I need? So what we got to do is solve for our sample size. Now the sample size n is located in the margin of error. That's the back part of the confidence interval formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the equation margin of error, I'm just using me, equals that critical z star times the standard error, which is again the formula of the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat all divided by n. So we're going to use that equation, we're going to substitute in everything that's given to us in the problem. We're going to be given a particular margin of error, we know the z star based on the level of confidence that we want to use, and then we, well, we don't know p hat, so what could we put in p hat? And again, why don't we know p hat? Because we don't even know our sample size. How can we know a sample proportion and we don't even know our sample size? Well, if you have no idea what p hat is, we could put 0.5 in for p hat, which makes 1 minus 0.5, also 0.5, then we could solve for n. But if there is something in the problem that tells you maybe what some past or historical data could be for the proportion, you could use that as well. Let's take a quick look at an example. Prior to an election, a mayoral candidate hoping to win against another candidate wishes to estimate the proportion of people in the city that will vote for him. He plans to construct a 95% confidence interval with only a plus or minus 2% margin of error. How many people should be in his sample? So we're going to start off with the formula for the margin of error. ME equals the Z star times the square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat all divided by N. We're going to substitute 0.02 in for the ME, that's the margin of error we want to find. For 95%, that's a Z star of 1.96. And again, he hasn't even looked at a sample yet, so he has no idea what a P hat can be. So we're going to put 0.5 and then 1 minus 0.5 is also 0.5 in our numerator there. Now we simply solve for N. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to divide by the 1.96, square both sides, multiply the N over, and divide. A mm, little bit of algebra I know, but overall it's not too bad. So the final answer for n is going to be taking 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 0.02 divided by 1.96 all squared. 
Again, follow the algebra that I have shown here. It's overall not too bad. And it gives our final example for the sample size that we would need to produce that given margin of error. And the fifth and final thing you need to know when it comes to constructing confidence intervals is this. Bigger samples vary less. Hence, bigger samples will have a smaller margin of error, which produces a smaller interval. So if you want to be really, really accurate as to what the population proportion is, get a bigger sample. When you have a bigger sample, the size of your interval is going to shrink, which means it's technically more accurate. Now, the other thing we could do is, well, change our level of confidence. But just know this, a higher level of confidence is always going to make a wider interval. But if we make our sample size bigger at the same time, then yes, because we're using more confidence, our interval is going to be wider. But if we have a bigger sample, then the interval is going to kind of simultaneously shrink as well. So the best case scenario is that we use a high level of confidence like 95, 98, 99. That's going to give us lots of confidence that we hope the population part population proportion is in our interval. And then if we use a big sample size, that's gonna make our interval smaller, which is going to give us a really small window of high accuracy for what that population proportion can be. All right, that's it. Hopefully this was just a quick video going over five really important things you need to know when it comes to constructing confidence intervals for population proportions. Be ready for the AP stats exam because all of these things are probably gonna come up either at an FRQ or multiple choice. Can't wait to see you in the next video.